Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're good to go. Unless somebody stops me, I'm going to start the proceedings now. Uh, my name is Mark Vesey. I'm the principal of Green College, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this virtual version of what would, in a slightly different world, be the coach house at Green College. And we've got just the right size group for the Green College coach house. There's about 30 people in the room at the moment. Um, perfect uh, for, a, for a good discussion after the presentations. Anyway, welcome everybody. Um, I would just like uh, to um, take this opportunity, first of all, uh, to thank the convener of today's event, uh, who is also the convener of this mini series entitled, brilliantly, Reciprocal Impact. Indigenous Reconciliation, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Reciprocal Impact Seeking Shared Promotion of Psychological Wellbeing and Social Justice. This is Cindy's brainchild and it sprang from her brain really very quickly, recently, in response uh, to the times uh, and the conditions that we're living in. And um, her agility in this matter has really been quite striking. Um, and this is a series which uh, is planned already up to a certain point. You'll find uh, a description of the series at the college website. We have a flyer for it that's been up on a screen, might even come up again. Um, but in any case, watch this space because I'm not sure that Cindy's extemporizing is quite at an end yet. In any case, I'd like to thank her for getting us to this point, uh, for making the arrangements for this afternoon. I'm, gladly turning things over to her now so that she can uh, introduce our presenters. Yes, because they're both now here. Thank you. I should have said Cindy's home department, since Green College is only ever an alibi for a faculty member at UBC. Uh, her real base is in the Department of Counseling Psychology uh, within the Faculty of Education, which is the name for that parallel university at UBC. Uh, on which we depend for so much of the good stuff that goes on around here. Enough from me, Cindy, Glidden Tracy, over to you and thank you. But you'll have to unmute. Absolutely, thank you. Welcome to the first event in this Reciprocal Impact series. We are so glad to have all of you joining us tonight to talk about Indigenous reconciliation and trauma-informed counseling. Thanks to you, Mark Vesey, and to the tremendous Green College team, and to the UBC Counseling Psychology Social Justice Committee for supporting tonight's events. We hope you'll also attend some of our upcoming events, with the next one being on November 19th. As Mark mentioned, I am Dr. Cindy Glidden Tracy from the Faculty of the Educational and Counseling Psychology and Special Education Department here at UBC. I'm delighted to introduce to you our two speakers for tonight. Before I do, I want to let you know that each presenter will speak for 20 minutes and each will be followed by a 10-minute question period. You may write your questions in the chat for me to read aloud, or you can just put your name in the chat for me to call on you in turn to unmute your mic uh, to, to ask your own question. I will acknowledge the questions in the order received. There will be an additional 20 minutes uh, for discussion when both presentations are complete. So I would like uh, to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Natasha Warico. And Natasha is an assistant professor in clinical psychology at the University of Victoria. She's also a graduate of our UBC Counseling Psychology program. Dr. Warwicko strives to pursue collaborative indigenous community-driven counseling opportunities that promote reconciliation and prosperity for the indigenous community. Her research highlights indigenous ways of healing and fostering self-worth. Her teaching uh, focuses on promoting reconciliation between the field of psychology and ind indigenous peoples, and her work contributes to the culturally sensitive delivery of clinical service and conduct of research. All you are is Dr. Warrico. Well, thank you very much for that, that warm welcome there, Cindy. Is everyone able to see my slides? Okay, there, I've got a couple thumbs up if you're able to see my screen there. Excellent, thank you, Mark, Cindy and others. 
so thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I'd like to start off uh, just by acknowledging uh, that my family comes from the Scapa Band in the interior of British Columbia, and today I'm joining you uh, via Zoom uh, from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples, as well as the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanish people whose historical relationship with the land continue to today. I'd also like to acknowledge the Musqueam people on whose territory uh, an ancestral and unceded land uh, the University of British Columbia stands. And thank you again uh, to you, Cindy, as well as the entire uh, CMPS Social Justice Committee, uh, the Faculty of Education, uh, our Counseling Psychology uh, Program, and of course, Green College for hosting this event. Uh, this is a wonderful step in promoting reconciliation with Indigenous people, and I'm so happy to see that this is a a collaborative initiative that many people are wanting to share. Something that I'm wanting to share today, uh, not that my presentation is intended to um, be triggering, however, I find that whenever I'm addressing uh, Indigenous issues that it's good to provide some counseling resources. And so what I want to do is, let's see if I can see the chat, chat here at the same time. So in the uh, chat, uh, section of Zoom. I've just put the resources that I have on the screen here for your reference, just so if anyone is needing to reach out, uh, these are some different Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, resources that are available 24-7, so please feel free to use that. And just note that if there's anyone in joining us from the U.S., that there is um, one support available in the U.S. at the bottom there. Okay, so Indigenous Peoples of Canada, uh, for those that know, 4.9% of our population is made up of those that identify as First, Nation, uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and this make up the three uh, ethnic groups of Indigenous people in Canada. Uh, the term Aboriginal is also used when collectively referring to this diverse population. However, I just want to acknowledge that this is a very diverse population made up of 614 different bands, each that have their own form of self-governments, culture, and language. And so it's not appropriate to assume that there's one way uh, of viewing Indigenous peoples uh, in Canada or across uh, Turtle Island. And unfortunately, there's substantial educational and health disparities that exist um, between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And in part, these disparities exist as a result of current as well as past colonial practices. And I do want to outline um, some of these events that have happened over time just to give context uh, to some of the current um, actions that we're going to be talking about today in terms of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So colonization is a process and action um, of setting and establishing control over a group uh, of Indigenous peoples. And this unfortunately has a political and economic impact, uh, as well as psychological and cultural influence. While there is unfortunately um, many colonial acts that have caused disruption to Indigenous people. Um, just kind of briefly, even here in this timeline, just highlighting some of the events. Uh, I just want to highlight that in 1844, the Bagot Commission report stated that Aboriginal uh, reserves in Canada were not acting in a civilized manner. And what this ended up triggering was later in 1982, uh, following the recommendation of the Davin report, um, that residential schools were created in Canada. And this was done by the Canadian Dutch government at the time to achieve what they... All right, so hopefully people are able to see the screen there. If you can just give me a quick thumbs up, it's back on there right now. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so as I was mentioning before, that the impact of colonization um, was very suppressive of people's cultural expression. Their language, their beliefs, their foods, their dress were actively discouraged uh, and often punished. And while it wasn't the expressed intent of the residential school system, uh, many pupils were unfortunately subjected to neglect, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. Uh, and these practices of forced assimilation contributed to the development of interracialized racism uh, in many of the students um, that were part of the residential school uh, experience, unfortunately. Uh, what this is a depiction right here uh, is of the number of residential schools in Canada. And while it's not important um, to be able to see all their names right now, it's just to show you that how vastly the country was um, affected by residential schools and that over a 104 year period, over 10,000 Aboriginal children were exposed to the systemic and structural flaws of the residential school uh, system. And it wasn't until 1996 that the very last residential school um, closed, which is actually quite shocking to realize that just in a recent past that that was still present. And the impact of this has just been, as I said, uh, intergenerational trauma effects uh, that are still affecting people at the community uh, as well as individual level. 
The Truth and Reconciliation um, is a component of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, and its mandate is to inform all Canadians about what happened in the residential schools. And what is depicted right here is where the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, visited across communities in terms of different uh, Indigenous communities to document the truth of the survivors, their families, communities, and anyone personally affected by the Indian residential school experience. Uh, the TRC provided those directly and indirectly by the um, legacy of the Indian, uh, Indian residential system with opportunity to share their stories and experiences. And the reason that I wanted to talk about uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their work going across Canada is that our own uh, Canadian Psychological Association in Canada uh, responded to this report and they came out um, with their response in terms of how psychologists across the world, but specifically in Canada, uh, should move forward in order to promote reconciliation. And so what I'm going to be briefly uh, covering today, but I do encourage you, um, the reference that I have here to be looking at uh, CPA's response, if you haven't already, uh, is to talk about how uh, in Canada, the profession of psychology has contravened its own ethics code. Uh, so the profession of psychology in Canada um, has four um, ethics codes, these main principles right here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be briefly walking through to be talking about how these ethics codes have not served Indigenous populations in Canada. So respect for the rights and dignity of persons and people. Uh, historically, the profession has failed to respect uh, the rights and dignity of Indigenous people by failing to acknowledge the social injustice that occurred over a century uh, and federal policies aimed at eradicating Indigenous culture uh, and people through the residential school experience. And as I mentioned before, this had a direct and intergenerational impact on the mental health of many Indigenous people in Canada. The second, uh, responsible caring. Uh, psychology has the moral obligation to welcome research that identifies cultural and tradition uh, as aspects of empowerment and treatment. And psychology as a collective uh, and profession has failed to meet this basic standard of care by relying on methods as well as epistemologies that are potentially harmful to Indigenous people and have not been grounded in appropriate uh, cultural understanding. Third, looking at the integrity in relationship. As a discipline, psychology has not upheld um, this ethics principle. Um, as a profession, uh, it is not engaged in a central culturally um, sensitive training um, within programs as a mandate uh, in our profession uh, that would reflect cultural values of Indigenous communities, uh, implicit biases, uh, and ethnocentric uh, values that dominate the psychology profession. Um, and if these were upheld, it would be easier to be engaging in the integrity of the relationship with Indigenous people. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, responsibility to society. Uh, psychology as a discipline um, has not demonstrated a respect for the social structure of Indigenous communities. Um, and that, uh, you know, Canadian Indigenous communities, uh, their practices, um, are extremely important um, and their conceptualizations of health um, and wellness have not been embraced by the Indigenous community as um, an equal uh, form and theoretical orientation compared to other um, Western orientations that we have. Uh, and the use, for example, of psychological tools um, to um, at times uh, discriminate uh, against Indigenous peoples um, has not helped to uh, benefit Indigenous communities. So uh, decolonization of psychology, this is a, a vast topic um, that I will be briefly talking about today. Um, decolonization is this process by which um, previously colonized people take steps to distance themselves um, from Eurocentric uh, views and colonial powers. And in terms of the decolonization of psychology, uh, I really like this quote here in terms of examining how Euro-American Euro scientific psychology has become the standard bearer of psychology. Um, decolonization of psychology is about recognizing that psychology um, is at times maladjusted. It's not that there's not good in psychology currently stands, but just that there are uh, maladjusted concepts that exist there and that there is an emphasis on Eurocentric views and beliefs um, and that there needs to be a correction in this imbalancement. So in terms of how we can support uh, the profession of psychology in terms of moving forward, again, this is not a, a quick fix to the solution, but these are three things to be keeping in mind in terms of your clinical practice and your research 
I'm going to be um, talking about uh, denaturalization, indigenization, and accompaniment. And decolonization um, scholars recommend following these different actions in order to help decolonize psychology. Again, these are not all encompassing, uh, nor really quick fixes, and they are topics that do overlap each other. So looking at denaturalization, um, this is being critical of marginalization and oppression where we're currently located. So asking yourself, how is my current knowledge system a reflection of colonization powers? And this can be a really big topic in terms of thinking about um, you know, the epistemology, uh, methodology, even the ontology that my research is built on. Where is that coming from and does it cater to uh, Indigenous values in the community that I'm working with? And then saying to yourself, how am I going to take action to disrupt the current colonial influence and knowledge system that I might currently have or might be learning or supporting? Uh, so are you taking steps to include Indigenous voices in your research committees uh, to facilitate the creation of projects, uh, the implementation and the analysis of research projects, and then finally the dissemination of results at the end? Uh, we need to be critical um, that oftentimes in colonized societies, uh, we embody a weird population definition. And for those of you that are not familiar with weird, uh, this stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic samples. So we have to be very um, clear as well in terms of the research we're conducting, even if it's not with Indigenous populations. You know, are we using these weird populations um, that are very Western-centric uh, focused? So next, in terms of talking about indigenization, um, access Indigenous knowledge sources to make sure that your research and clinical work reflects an alliance with local populations. So this is identifying knowledge keepers in the local community, elders, for example, um, and help build relationships with them. And of course, prior to obtaining this kind of knowledge from community members, we must first give to the communities. People often ask me, you know, how is it that you make connections with the indigenous community, include them in their research. And it's so important, like in any kind of relationship that you have, that you get to know people, and especially in this population, that there's a giving before you're asking. It has to be a reciprocal relationship back and forth, not just something that benefits your own uh, needs and research interests. Uh, hold knowledge keepers wisdom on the same level as other academic scholars and I have had the opportunity um, of having some wonderful professors in the counseling psychology department at UBC who have valued uh, Indigenous knowledge keepers and you know have held their um, their guidance on the same level as other research committee uh, members and I really appreciated that and this is something that I hope for many more colleagues that I'll have that they'll embrace that tradition um, in order to facilitate ownership of knowledge and not just keeping uh, knowledge at the academic level and not including the community. So just some examples of an indigenization of the community um, within academia, you know, requiring students um, in various disciplines to be taking a certain number of credits in indigenous courses in order to learn about the history of colonization and steps for promoting reconciliation in the future, uh, inclusion of indigenous history and representation on campus, um, and also indigenization education training at the faculty level in addition to students. So accompaniment, uh, this is physically traveling to colonize, racialize, and marginalize communities to collaborate uh, alongside local indigenous communities. Um, so again, you know, there's an overlap here uh, with indigenization, but this is about connecting with the community so that we're walking alongside them uh, and building knowledge uh, together. Uh, this will enact change through coming to the community, again, at the same level as the locals and helping to support change the community is wanting. So again, bringing yourself in at the same level, not feeling a superior, um, and doing projects that would really support uh, what they're wanting to work on. So in terms of wanting to promote action uh, and continue learning about this topic, I've just provided a couple links here and I'll put them in the conversation down uh, below afterwards, um, just about some resources for promoting reconciliation within your own classes, um, in terms of education resources, as well as in research. So I have a link here to a decolonization toolkit, uh, ideas for acts of reconciliation, and also a link to the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission report. All right. Well, thank you very much for that different presentation. Right there. <laughs> thank you so much, Natasha. That was really good. And um, again, I really appreciate, appreciate your grace under pressure there. 
Um, I wanted to see if anyone has any questions for Dr. Warwicko. I don't see any questions at this point in the chat, so you can um, either put your name in the chat or if you have a question, you can put that in the chat as well. It's also fine if you want to save your questions uh, for after the second presenter. Um, and since we had a little bit of an interruption there, is that okay with you, Natasha, if we go forward? That's fine with me. Okay, great. So next I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Chi. Dr. Chi completed her PhD at Arizona State University and she's a licensed counseling psychologist certified in providing evidence-based prolonged exposure therapy and cognitive processing therapy. Since 2008, uh, Dr. Chi has worked with the Women's Stress Disorder Treatment Team Clinic for the New Mexico Veterans Affairs Healthcare System and also uh, at the Albuquerque Vet Center, providing assessments, individual and group therapy, and outreach and clinical care to indigenous communities in New Mexico. She has experience with um, individual and family therapy, evidence-based group therapy, and culturally responsive program evaluation with veterans and indigenous communities. She's coordinated three National Science Foundation uh, grant projects, and in 2013, the American Psychological Association awarded her the Outstanding Early Career Award for Ethnic Minority Psychologists in Trauma Psychology. I'm glad to have you here, Chris. You'll need to unmute. There okay, you. thank you for the introductions. All right, so I am um, Dr. Chi, I tend to go by Chris. I work at the um, Albuquerque Vet Center I am from the Navajo Nation, my, um, my clan. We have four clans that we usually introduce ourselves, but I'll start with my first two clans. It's um, my maternal clan is um, and my dad's clan is um, Tenjikine. So with that, that's who I am as a Navajo woman. And I've been doing some therapy for quite some time. So um, I'll go ahead and start with my part of the presentation. Okay, so the overview that I have, there's some things that I'm just gonna breeze on through because I, I did record myself and there's two clip, video clips that will be um, provided the tail end. So the overview of this is gonna be talking about the two, 2010 census, um, tribes in New Mexico to sort of do that land acknowledgement on my part with New Mexico. And then talking about um, brief history of Navajo Nation and um, why is it important? And I kept it with Navajo Nation because the, with the US, we have over 500 recognized tribe or federally recognized tribes. And then a brief introduction of historical trauma and sharing what is PTSD, about how do we share that with a native patient in our office. And then the bottom part, seven through 10, are things that I'm not gonna cover, but I think they're also worth knowing. Um, I'm just assuming that since this is a clinical audience that are doing counseling kind of work, um, that you guys might have some insight of that already. Okay, so with that being said, with the, with the two, 2010 census, there's um, over 300 million people that are in the U.S. and out of that, right, the highest population is the white population at 76.3, but if you look at Native Americans, it's 1.3%. And then the seven largest tribes, there's again, 565 federally recognized tribes. I chose the top seven because it drops quickly at between six and seven. Cherokee is the largest tribe in the US on the Navajo Nation. There's over 300,000 of us. Um, again, with the Navajo Nation, we are the second largest tribe, but we have the largest land reserve and it goes across, um, or that um, reservation is equivalent to the state of West Virginia. Virginia. So the top three states that we have is California, um, Oklahoma, and Arizona for having Native Americans. And part of this is from um, years ago, there has been an act in place to have, um, to try to work towards urbanizing Native Americans. So and that's why some of these states have the highest of um, different Na um, Native Americans. Since I am from New Mexico, or I'm living now in New Mexico, I put the numbers there. So there's 193,000 Native Americans in New Mexico. And with this, this is a part I thought I could share that land acknowledgement the, um, tradition that is um, set up in Canada that I wasn't aware of. But, um, so I thought I'd share this part. I, I am Navajo in New Mexico. There's 27 tribes. 
If you look at these columns, there's some that end with Pebble, so there's Acoma, Pebble, um, Hamus, you know, and so forth. The same thing happens with the Apache, so there's a Hickory Apache, there's a Mescalero Apache. In Arizona, there's also other bands of Apaches, like there's um, White Mountain, Apache, San Carlos, and so forth. Me being Navajo, I just wanted to share with you that there's two bands of Navajo that are smaller in New Mexico, and then there's the Navajo Nation. So the smaller bands of Navajo is Rama and um, Canyoncito. They, re they view the Navajo Nation, they call it Big Navajo. So I think I come from Big Navajo, anyways. So the next slide is sort of the history. So I really focused on Navajo because that's where I am Navajo and there's some information that I've been um, given throughout the, the time I've been a child. So I thought some of these things sound familiar and then there's other things that I've learned later in life that wasn't shared to me early on. So we do call ourselves um, the net, which means the people. Uh, we are across um, several states. So Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. Our, again, our land mass is um, equivalent to the state of West Virginia. Our language is called Diné. It's, um, it's constantly evolving. So one of the things I often share is that we coin words. So um, for instance, for airplane, we say Chidinata'a, that means the car that flies. Um, I, I'm sharing that part because uh, if we're not involved with the Navajo community, sometimes we lose that, um, that insight of how new words are coming about. Our, our nation is the Winderock, it's Winderock, Arizona. We're well known for the Navajo code talkers. Um, some literature says there's been at least 400 that have served as Navajo code talkers during, uh, in the Marine Corps during this war. We're also well known for making jewelry, rugs, and blankets. So again, I don't have time to really go into details, but we have a long history of being in different types of wars, you know, back in the late 16th century through like with the Spanish government, Mexican government, US government, and even with other bands and, and settlements near the Navajo Nation. So the long walk, this is the part where I thought I should start uh, spending a little bit more time on it because my grandparents did talk about this often. Um, in 1860, the US military and Mexican-Americans, Zunis are a band of native tribes or, and Utes. They raided the Navajo land. The Navajos retaliated and that led to four people dying. Um, and then Kit Carson in 1863 started this campaign saying that we're uncolonized or we're savages and we couldn't be controlled. Um, so he put a campaign against the Mescalero Apache and the Navajos. In 1864, this led to the long walk. Um, 8,000 to 9,000 people were forced to walk from these different states all through Bosco, Redondo. It's near, um, it's southeast of Albuquerque. So the natives, the Navajo uh, families that walked on this journey, it ranged from 300 to 450 miles. Um, in Navajo, we call it Huelde. Um, the, the place that was our, our prison camp. A lot of people also died at the camp. And then four years later came about the Treaty of Bosco Redondo, then they walked back. So the part that I hear about often is that there's been a, a handful from my community that went on this long walk. And my grandmother used to say, your, your clan system is really important because wherever you go, you're gonna find relatives through that clan system. So she said the ones that went on that long walk um, connected with others um, through relations through the clan system. So I think that's important to know that our clan is part of our identity and um, it helps us keep our relations. And the other thing is that last bullet part it says that a lot of people were captured and killed and some people hid in Navajo Mountain, Grand Canyon and Canyon de Shea. So with my relatives or my ancestors, a lot of them hid in the Grand Canyon. So that's where um, my mom's from. Okay. So boarding school. So this one here, I know Natasha talked about it earlier. It, for the U.S., it started in 1879 by General Pratt. Um, we call it a Carlisle boarding school. Um, it, it did reach the Navajo Nation. 
part of their goal was to, was forced assimilation. Um, it did start in the 1800s, and a lot of times we talk about it as if it happened back then, but not now. So my mom is born in 1951. When she was a kid, she was told, um, if you see any white vehicle, make sure you go hide in a sheep corral. And she said on one of those days that she got caught playing, a, a, a white truck came and picked up her and her sister. So that wasn't too long ago. So my mom is part of the boarding school era and her sister. Um, the thing that I think with history, right, is we learn some things about us through, through textbooks. Um, and I didn't know my mom's boarding school experience until I was working on my thesis at Arizona State. So I think that's the other thing too, right, is how do we share, how do we capture that part with Native Americans and be supportive? Um, so the other thing that I want to talk about is Native religion. Again, there was an act that was passed in 1887 where Native Americans were forbidden to use their own religion. And it wasn't even lifted until 1978. So again, that is relatively recent. That's 42 years ago. We finally can practice without hiding and doing things secretly. So the Indian Relocation Act, earlier I said there's three states that have the most um, concentration of Native Americans. Part of that happened with, through this Indian Relocation Act. So a lot of, um, the U.S. was always had this underlying goal to assimilate Native Americans. So a lot of them, um, like with the Navajo Nation, they were told they can go to these cities, get an education, provide, you know, a place of their own. They got some support, but it wasn't enough to be self-sufficient. So some people did become in, um, homeless during that time. So why share a snapshot of Navajo history? Because a lot more can be said, right? But I chose the ones that I've heard about growing up and then as I've gotten older. So our morals, values, and beliefs do change over time. And it's being mindful of that. And I think also is that just even within the Navajo Nation, we have individual differences. Our tribe is so large that even our dialect is different from like they call mine the Western Agency where I live. Our dialect is different from the Eastern Agency. Um, so the reason why I also shared those clippings is that it ties right into historical trauma, right? All this stuff has happened for generations and a lot of times we don't acknowledge how far back this stuff goes and if we look at the stuff in the present. So some things may have been carried down. Um, I know like I've been fortunate to have parents that value education, even though they were forced to be in a boarding school that had a lot of um, physical abuse and emotional abuse. And they didn't share it when we were kids. So I think that's the other thing too, right? How do we get the elders to talk more about this to providers that help Native Americans? So with historical trauma, right, it's been around this terminology for quite some time. It started with research done on people that were in the Holocaust concentration camps. So that's where this term originated. Some stories that I've heard is that the people that survived the Jewish, um, the Jewish communities have studied Native Americans to see how we had, um, I guess, come back from being on forced um, reservations also. So some symptoms of historical trauma is like depression, anxiety, denial, survivor's guilt, um, isolation, and so forth. So I'm kind of keeping track of the time. And um, the other thing is like, how does this impact us? It impacts our individual well-being, right? There's heart disease, diabetes, some of those end up being carried on to the next generation. Um, it impacts family dynamics, um, community settings, sense of identity, support system, coping strategies. And I think sometimes the way parents teach is impacted from these types of traumas. Um, I know my dad used to say, Chris, today you don't speak Navajo, you can't say you're Navajo. And I thought, that's terrifying. So <laughs> for the longest time, I thought I'm going to not be Navajo soon. So that I think that's the kind of teaching sometimes is foster to try to hang on to our uh, way of being. Again, keeping historical trauma in mind and sharing PTSD with a client, right? So 
I've been doing trauma work for so long and um, there's some things that I have um, do repetitiously and I keep thinking like, this is such a long thing to do for every patient, but I always think too, they need to see the bigger picture of how they're getting stuck. And so this one here is just saying that as a provider, keep things in mind of like, how do you use, how do you use auditory kinds of um, teaching or visual aids or reading material? We do this for people that are diabetic or have chronic pain, but sometimes we don't do the same thing for mental health. Again, this one here, I created this fictitious case to kind of give an idea of what, why I did those two video clippings that I'll be sharing shortly. Um, but the, what I normally do in, in my office is a lot longer. I tried to shorten it, but I also thought, how often do we get to see it happening? Like, how do we do the therapy part working with Native Americans? Um, but I, anyways, with that being said, this information here is regarding a Navajo female 32-year-old Army veteran who served five years in the military, and her trauma happened 20 years ago in the military. She has a traditional background, has had an enemy way ceremony done right after discharge. She's a high school graduate, bilingual, divorced, has no children, and lives with her parents. So the, the ceremony did help for years, but what has happened is some nightmares, flashbacks, and other issues that are related to depression start to resurface. Again, this is just a fictitious scenario. It's not any one person. Um, the stresses for this person is having little income through self-employment, cannot afford another ceremony then. Um, a lot of these ceremonies are costing the thousands and a lot of times it involves community effort. So if you think about PTSD at its worst, a lot of times they burn a lot of bridges. So a lot of times they don't get that support they need for this kind of ceremony. Um, sometimes they have, so the other stressor is having little social support and having no transportation. The clinical impression after doing a chart review is PTSD and dep depression. Treatment options, right, there's a lot out there. So I just kept it in general here, exploring all options, including traditional healing, psychotherapy, and medication. So the, the two slides, or the two videos I have, this was gonna be the slide in between the two, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do both of them because Ellen will help me um, show the, the video. And the video is kind of cheesy, but um, bear with me on that part. The, this last slide is, um, lastly, people are, as providers, right, help our Native client navigate their mental health care, write information for their continued mental health care using, using visual aids, reading material, et cetera and normalize that they may need occasional maintenance therapy and or traditional ways of healing to continue better managing these flare-ups. Um, the reason why I say that is sometimes um, their first go around, they're so anxious that they don't hear or really grasp all these tools that are handy. So I always tell them, you know, you may need to do it twice, but that's okay. Our goal is to make it where it's meaningful to you. So those are things I think I want to share. There's more detail in it this I really thought It'd be nice to cover, but I don't have that kind of time with what we're given today. But I think this kind of gets that ball rolling. So with that being said, that's the rest of my power. This is all for the PowerPoint slide, and then I'll give it to Alan if, um, to, to show the videos. here what I would like to do is have you be the patient that I'm thinking of it's a little bit of everybody that I've worked with so far so visualize yourself being 32 years old being Native American a female veteran um, that has served five years in the military okay and now you're 32 years old in my office so this is something that I often share also with veterans early on in therapy to understand what are some of the components that maybe um, that we need to keep in, in mind. Okay, so again, I'm gonna be talking about this as if you're a patient in my office. So what we're dealing here, you know, and what we're dealing here is when trauma happens, there's a lot of things that take place. You might see something, you might hear something, you might taste something. There's all these emotions. 
maybe even the time of year. So it could be sunny or dark. And we're saying that all our senses kick in when trauma happens, right? So when we lose control of what's happening, that, that's where the fight or flight response kicks in or sometimes we freeze. The other thing is that we shut down our emotions through trauma. So if you're struggling with PTSD, right, with later in life and when things get challenging, the brain starts thinking we have to control everything so nothing bad happens again. So we become this fist. The other thing is the other extreme, the open fist where sometimes people have said, I don't care, bad things keep happening anyways. With the emotions, usually I say, you know, I think when things get challenging, we shut down our emotions because the brain is thinking, if I can survive my trauma not feeling, then it's probably best I don't feel those emotions. However, what we see is a range of anger. And anger is a protective feeling, so this will start to kick in when you start to feel vulnerable, start to feel anxious, scared, sad, all those emotions. So if we keep this in mind, right and now we're saying you're relatively safe there's probably some things that you might be avoiding because of the trauma you've experienced and how your worldview has changed your your beliefs about the, the world who you trust who you don't trust all those things so the common things that i often we often see is avoiding crowds a lot of times your brain starts thinking right if I can't see everything, something bad could happen. So we don't go to baseball games or basketball games or concerts. The one that's a bit tricky is avoiding events. So let's say I have PTSD and I have trauma in my life, right? If my best friend does say she has a birthday party coming up, I might be tempted to go, but I decline because I don't know who's going to be there. My thought is, what if they ask me something personal and I share too much? What if they judge me in a certain way so I don't go? Then later, what we often see is beating ourselves up. I should have just gone. Why do I keep doing this? That kind of mindset. The other things that can be challenging is avoiding anniversaries of trauma. So if I had a trauma that happened in the summer, right, and it was really hot, when the season starts to change from spring to summer, I might be thinking more about it, or I might have nightmares because those memories are coming up. So if I don't want the nightmares, I start to avoid sleep. So these things here, right, become challenging. Holidays, anniversaries, crowds, events, and more. So with this being said, every time I avoid, right, every time somebody that has PTSD avoids, there's this reinforcement that happens. So if your trauma, if you're now 32 years old and your trauma happened at 20 years old, there's certain things that you have been doing for 12 years. So this bond here is pretty strong. And what we're trying to do, right, is put a little break in there. We're just getting the ball rolling. But some of the symptoms you may have worked through over time. It just varies. So what we're here today is really work on learning more about what are these traumas how do you avoid them when you're now relatively safe? Sometimes I also share that sometimes people collude with us. So if my trauma was a motorcycle accident or some kind of accident, right? I may have a fear of driving. The more I avoid driving and the more people help me get to plan A or B, they, if they drive me to these places, my brain keeps thinking, these places are just as dangerous as my trauma and it, it gets reinforced. Okay. This other thing I want to share with you is that I want to erase this part. And draw the scale of anxiety. So anxiety is one of the symptoms of PTSD, or sometimes people say, I get clammy, my chest gets tight, or my heart starts beating faster. So with anxiety, let's say there's an event that I go to and I have PTSD, okay? So let's say I go to this event, it could be a small birthday party, okay? 
somebody there starts laughing loud or it's just too crowded all of a sudden i can't breathe and my anxiety goes up i can't handle it so i escape when i escape they're saying that i am creating an avoidance strategy so there's a whole laundry list of what people do to bring down their anxiety one is isolating so I might sit in my car for five minutes and just think like, what just happened, right? So initially it doesn't take very long to regroup, okay? The other one is I might go home, pick a fight, or get super busy, or I cause some kind of drama. The third one is that I might take medication, alcohol, or drugs. So, when I do avoid, that's where this attachment happens. I am now saying that this event is just as dangerous as my trauma. And with time, I start to add other places. Next thing you know, 10 years later, I'm avoiding baseball games or other birthday parties or graduations, my work. The more I avoid, they're saying that my anxiety goes up a little bit higher than I escape. So with this process here, with time, there's certain things that are my part of my daily events that makes my anxiety go so high that I just want to avoid. The more I avoid, they're saying that this turns into hours or days, and then fighting, staying busy, being overly causing drama. We push people away even though we want them to be close to us. So we start to lose our support system. We start struggling with depression. And then with medication, alcohol, and drugs, because we gain tolerance, we start to need more to get the same effect. So in this process here, right, is that we create this vicious cycle and the PTSD symptoms start to take care of itself. So with keeping that in mind, right, these events here, right, is making our anxiety go so high that it feels like it's, we're back in our trauma. The main difference here is that this trauma, we felt terror. And in this trauma, we are trying to get through it. We did whatever we can to get through the trauma. So with that being said, this is one way that the PTSD starts to maintain itself. The problem with this is that over time, right, they're saying that our baseline of anxiety gets higher than where it should be. So physically, we start to feel tense. We might have more headaches problems with concentration. So sometimes people have said, gosh, when I start something, I don't finish it because I get distracted, then I get depressed or overwhelmed or problems with sleep. So this is the physical toll. This part here, we call the anticipatory anxiety. So our anxiety may peak even before we start something. So if you're sitting here very anxious, you're right on board because your anxiety is probably a bit higher than where it should be. And I'm glad you came because when it's too high, sometimes it's easy to back out. So this is sort of how I like to share PTSD because if we don't share this part, right, it's hard to see where you're coming from and it's scary when you don't know what's happening. So our goal here is to talk a little bit more about what is PTSD, how does it maintain itself? Okay, I'll stop here. It's really interesting, Chris. Is there a second video lined up now? Um, yes, there should be one that it's a bit shorter. Great. Uh, just one moment. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. So this is an example that I tend to use also to share a little bit more about the things that we're dealing with along with PTSD possibly. Okay, so let's say this is a bar chart and this is symptoms. So I and low. There's some comorbidities that show with PTSD. A lot of times, some of the older research data shows that before somebody reaches out for help, 
Um, they try things on their own. Sometimes people stay busy. Sometimes they do other things to try to manage those symptoms or just thought of this too shall pass. So when somebody is coming into our office, a lot of times, like for veterans they are saying, they often wait five to seven years. That's some of the older data. Some of the newer data is showing that um, people are waiting from two to three years to reach out for help. So if we keep that part in mind, when somebody is in our office for PTSD, right, their symptoms are pretty high. The other thing that we notice is depression is another possibility. Um, substance use, um, abuse, OCD traits, and family issues. So with treatment, what we're hoping, right, is that with time, their symptoms become more manageable as we work together. So let's say oh, this is an imaginary line of how PTSD symptoms are dropping with time. The other thing is that sometimes these tools can help depression. What we've noticed though, is that sometimes patients will think they're more depressed when they, so sometimes their thought is, I thought I wouldn't be as depressed, but I feel more depressed. Part of it is that it is because we didn't focus on it, it's more noticeable. There's some alleviation of it, but there's still some present. With substance use and abuse, I usually share that our long-term goal is to change the use of it, right? Is so we're hoping that they're using the alcohol to enhance their dinner or to enjoy something or for a social event, but it's not to manage anxiety or to manage other stuff related to PTSD. With OCD traits, what we often hear is sometimes I, I close the garage door and I start second guessing myself. So I go back and check that kind of behavior is more PTSD related. We're hoping those will come down with time also. With family issues, I always think I, it can go in either directions. If it comes down, right, a lot of it's because the family members are on board, they're supportive, they're comfortable with this person that has gone through treatment to be more confident and assertive. However, if family members are um, disappointed with that, like let's say if I have PTSD, all of a sudden I'm thinking, I don't have to do everything. These guys in my household can help me. I can share these responsibilities those individuals in that household will find that difficult or they will not want that extra responsibility. So it actually may increase family problems. So that's the part, I really never know how this is gonna play out. But this is also an example I share because it's important that family members or patients that are in our office may have more than one issue to address and we're just getting that ball rolling. And, and so I, that's the last part was I, I usually tell veterans that with this last area, I never know which way it's gonna go, but we do have family therapy available where we can talk about PTSD with family members. That's sort of how I wrapped up that last video. That's everything for, for my part. Sorry, I just muted myself. That was really great. Thank you to both of you presenters. I really, like you presented us some really excellent information and uh, we really appreciate your great efforts here today. Um, I want to open it up now for any comments or questions that people would like to share.